Amen. Thank y'all so much. Well, I'm in college at William Carey University. Um, fingers crossed, I'll be finishing in May. And I say fingers crossed because I've got, I told the kids in Sunday school, about seven, eight essays to do between now and then. And a lot of my essays require me to gather research. And so this morning, we're going to gather some research. Now, I'm not going to use this for an academic sense. This is just some fun research, okay? So audience participation, raise your hand if you have ever had a conversation. Some of you are lying. I didn't get, <laughs> didn't get everybody's hand raised on that one. All right, let's, let's narrow the field now. You, you want to always narrow down your research when you're doing research um, to, to the most specific to, to your question as possible. So raise your hand if you've had a conversation in the last 30 days, last month. Perfect. Okay. Uh, if you've sent a text message in the last 30 days. Let's see that one. Okay. Some of you have sent a text message and didn't respond to my text message, and I'm, I'm going to talk to you after church. But now, this is, this is where some toes are going to feel stepped on, but raise your hand if you have ever said something in a conversation and later regretted it. Okay. So we're, we're in the same playing field today, and, and you'll see this morning that we're discussing James 3, and at the bottom there it says taming the tongue. So we're talking about conversations and taming the tongue. So... Let me get up here. I'm done with my research, by the way. I can't wait to get to May and say that for my degree, but I'm done with my research for this morning. So we're in James 3. And in James 3, we realize that the tongue is a useful asset that we rely on for basic human functions daily. And while it's a powerful device, the tongue also bears a lot of responsibility and can get us into a lot of trouble when we use it to say words that are unbecoming of Christians. If we are to live like Christ daily, Christians should strive to tame their tongue, for it is a powerful weapon. So if you'll stand with me in the honor of reading God's word as we look at James 3, verses 1 through 12. Beginning in verse 1, let not many of you Become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by a strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very word of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Or every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and heavenly Father, as we dive into your word this morning, I thank you for this opportunity, and I thank you for your redeeming love that was sent on Calvary, Lord, that we have a chance and a hope at taming the tongue and, and becoming the likeness of, of Christ in our, in our lives daily, Lord. Lord, I pray that as the sermon continues, that my words disappear and your words are illuminated through me, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, and I ask that you bless it for your kingdom and glory forever. Amen. So let me cut to the chase real quick. Um, the central idea of this text is that the reader is warned that the tongue is dangerous, powerful weapon, and it should be tamed with every effort. We see from the very first few verses there in James 1, excuse me, James 3, verse 1, 
that not many of us should become teachers knowing that such will we will incur a stricter judgment. Now, this does not, those of you in the room who are pursuing an education uh, to become a teacher, this is not speaking of a Mr. Lindemann or a Mr. Dyke. So this is speaking more of a Brother Taylor, Brother Kyle, or Brother Clay, a teacher of the gospel. That we, we bear a responsibility to you, our congregation, to you, our church, to preach the gospel. And in doing so, if we fail to do so, we incur a stricter judgment. We, we will be held to a higher standard because we owe it to you as our church. We owe it, I owe it to the kids in the back, the youth group, to preach the gospel at every opportunity. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> for, uh, verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. We're in Brooklyn. I don't have to explain a horse to you all, but you know what? Let me take some research. Who has ridden a horse in here? So we know how to steer a horse through a bit in the mouth. I won't bite this pencil, but a bit in the mouth and you steer a horse that way. And, and the horse is, I don't know the size of a horse, but a horse is big. Okay. But you're steering it with, with just this tiny, tiny piece of metal or what have you, but you're steering it with this tiny um, bit in its mouth and you're steering the entire body of that horse. We see later in verse four, look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, they are still directed by a small rudder whenever the inclination, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Boats and ships are directed, just as the text says, not by, you know, a, a mammoth um, mammoth rudder, but just this tiny, almost the size of this. And you steer the entire ship. It's so small, yet bears so much power and responsibility. Why is this? Well, we see later in the scripture, the, the, why he gives these metaphors that he does. In verse 5, he says, So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. We all struggle with our words. We all struggle with what to say. And sometimes we, work, we struggle with what we said. We struggle with how we said it and what we, what we said to upset someone else. It boasts in great things. He goes on to give a, a example of a fire. See how this is Verse five still, see how a great, great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our lives. And it is set on fire by hell. We see that we face this battle. We face a, a battle and we all face the same battle to to work our words better, to, to say better words, to, to say better things, and to, to remove the iniquity and uh, self, selfish words from our vernacular, or from our vocabulary. So we see that the tongue is a fire set fire by hell. For every species of beast and birds, verse 7, thank you, Species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. The battle has been set for us. We cannot tame our own tongue. We cannot, it, the, the scripture clearly says that. So what hope do we have? What, what is the purpose of this sermon? What is the purpose of life if we cannot tame our own tongue if we cannot no one can tame the tongue our the sermon is titled taming the untamable and and it simply is untamable except for and i didn't give this scripture upstairs and i apologize so just listen hard but uh except for that our we we have a hope in this but in Matthew 15, verse 18, as Brother Kyle read this morning, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, 
and those defile the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, defile the man. So we see here that out of our heart comes, comes words from our mouth. Out of our heart comes words. Sorry, I, I'll English better in a second. So out of our heart, I'm going to say it again, out of our heart comes, comes our words. And so it really goes back to a heart issue. What is, what is our heart? And we realize this, that if our heart is not right, then our tongue bears no chance to say righteous words, to say righteous things. And so we realize in, in that, that out of, our, out of our heart comes words from the mouth. We realize our need for a savior. We realize that we cannot bear this alone. We cannot face this battle alone, but that we need a savior in this fight. And that takes us to James chapter three, verse nine. With our tongue, with it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. We'll stop there a second. We bless our Father and we turn to men who are made in his image and curse them. If you give me verse 10. From the same mouth, both blessing and cursing. My brethren, this is where James stops the narrative. James is the, the, the last of this chapter, the last nine verses, nine and a half verses have been narrative. They read like a, a speech. But this is where he stops that narrative and looks at his audience and says to his audience, he's writing now, for those of you who don't know, James is... Um, Historians say that the book of James was written by the half-brother of Jesus, who was not converted while Jesus was on earth, but converted after his resurrection. And he is writing to the 12 tribes of Israel that were scattered abroad. So he's saying to the, the Israelites, to, to the brethren, he says, my brethren, these things ought not to be this way. He's saying, if we're going to, to bless the Father, if we're going to, to come on Sunday morning and, and lift our hands in worship, by Sunday afternoon, by, by the middle of the week, by Saturday, we can't curse one another. We can't, we can't be rude to one another. We cannot bless out each other and then go and, and, and praise our Father. We, we can't do that. And he, he provides some metaphors later on, if I can have verse 11. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Now, in this room, we, we are all smart people, and you realize that if you try to drink fresh water and bitter water at the same time, you're going to get a bitter taste in your mouth. You're, going to get, you're not going to taste them both separately. You're going to taste them simultaneously, and it's probably going to be gross. Verse 12 says, Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? You, you, can't, you can't be a, a fig tree and produce a fruit that you don't make. You cannot, in, in our lives as Christians, we cannot be Christians and produce bad fruit. Likewise, a person who is not a Christian cannot produce good fruit. Nor can salt water produce fresh. Things simply... You simply cannot go back and forth with this. Verse 10, I'll, I just want to repeat that one more time. That my brethren, these things not ought to be this way. Cannot bless and curse from the same mouth. So what hope do we have then of fixing this problem? We realize that our need for a savior, like I said before, we realize that we cannot face this battle alone and we need our savior. The Apostle Paul, I love Paul. He writes to the church at Colossae in Colossians 4, verse 2. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. 
praying at the same time for all of us as well, that God will open up a door to us for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I've also been in prison, that you make it clear in the way I ought to speak. And then this is chapter four, excuse me, Colossians chapter four, verse six. I'm sorry, it's not on the screen, but it says, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Friday night, we had a reception in the fellowship hall and I, I have been in many churches. My grandfather was a pastor. I have never seen such a great hostess committee. Amen. Yes, yes. I have never seen such a great hostess committee, and I happen to serve on it, so yeah, thank you. But, <laughs> but I've never seen such a great hostess committee. They are on top of everything. Our ice maker's out, and somebody's always getting ice to make sure that we can always have lunches and, and um, fellowship lunches and this and that. We have such a great hostess committee, and I've concluded that here in the South, we know how to eat because we know how to cook, okay? Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are not many dishes that, that we eat that don't have salt as a seasoning, that don't, I mean, even plain water is going to have a sprinkle of salt in it, I, I have concluded. Thank you, Mr. Cliff, for laughing. But even, even rice is going to have salt in it. There, there's not, I, I'm trying to brainstorm something. I mean, we put salt in ice cream here, guys. We put salt in everything because we realize that, number one, it has nutritional value, but it makes food taste better, okay? Great food Friday night. Thank you, Miss Jenny. Thank you. Anyway, but this is, I feel like while Paul is writing to the church of Colossia, he is writing to the church at Brooklyn. He is writing to the church of South Mississippi here because we know how to cook and we know how to season food, okay? So he says, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Let your, let your speech be seasoned with grace how, how Mr. Cliff seasons his chili, okay? Let, let, let your, your speech be so full of grace that, that people have no other option than to hear Jesus when you speak. And even if they don't hear Jesus, they can't hear the world when you speak, okay? You speak so graciously that they can't hear chastisement and, and accusal in your speech, they hear grace. Let your speech always be seasoned with, with grace as so seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. It's easier said than done, though. It, it, it is. It is a, a battle that we're all going to face. And, you know, it if we all made salt shakers that said grace on them and carried them around with us in our pockets and were reminded constantly that way, yes, that maybe that would work for a season. Oh, not in intended. Maybe that would work for a season and we could carry that around with us to remind us to season our, our words with grace. If we, if we had a text reminder to, to speak graciously all the time, maybe that would work for a season. But there is an example and a Savior in the gospel that has given us sorry, given us his roadmap, his direction on how to always be seasoned with grace, always be seasoned with a likeness of Christ in our lives. So in Galatians 5, 20 through, 22 to 25, James 3 ends with Two, two vines that cannot bear, there it is, can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs, nor, or a vine produce figs. It ends with this example of fruit. You cannot bear uh, fruit. You cannot bear the world's fruit and uh, the fruit of Christ at the same time. And so it, I, I leave you with this message is that, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. 
Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Our speech is not the problem. Our, our tongue is not the problem. It is a, a very small part, and it, it does bear a lot of power. But it's our heart. And from our heart, we will show the fruit that we, we bear. We will show who we are from our heart. From our, from our heart, just like it says in Matthew 15, 18. I'll repeat that one more time. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. But if we desire to show the fruit of the Spirit, to show love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, of which there is no law against, we must first start with our heart and say, Jesus, I need you to cleanse my heart, to, to make me a righteous person to make me, to cleanse me of my iniquity, to cleanse my speech of, of wrongful vocabulary, and to set me on a path of righteousness. Because aside from Jesus Christ, we are doomed to fall short in our pursuit of taming the tongue. It is my prayer today that you learned that while we struggle with our words and we all face the same battle, we all need a savior. Our supplementary scriptures provide the blueprint for taming the tongue. Our hearts need to be constantly in pursuit of Jesus and his love. Then our tongues will flow with kindness. So my invitation to you today is to respond to the Holy Spirit and to commit your life to the pursuit of Christ daily. Commit your life, actions, and even your words to Christ.